Are we ready to start? Yep. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this year's Fort Collins Book Fest. I am Corey Radman, your moderator for this event. I serve as a member of the Pooter Library's Board of Trustees. In my professional life, I work as a ghostwriter and an editor for independent authors, especially memoirists. So I'm very excited to be here tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize a few of our festival sponsors. BookFest is produced by Poudre River Public Library District. Our presenting sponsors are Old Firehouse Books, the Colorado State University Libraries, and CSU English Department. Further support has been provided by Colorado Creative Industries, Poudre River Friends of the Library, Poudre Library Trust, Colorado Humanities, Front Range Community College, and Liggett, Johnson, and Goodman. Our amazing media partners are KUNC and 105.5 The Colorado Sound. Thank you to all of them. I have a couple housekeeping notes. You will be able to ask questions of our panelists as the hour proceeds. Please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function here in Zoom for that. That just helps us track the questions more easily. If you're on a computer, you just hover over the bottom of your screen until the controls appear. You should see the Q&A button pop up when you hover like that. Or if you're on a phone or tablet, you can tap on the bottom of your screen to reveal the Q&A button. You are welcome to type your questions in at any time during the session, though we'll save most audience questions for the end of the panel. With that, let's get our session started. Memoir is a narrative written about a specific part of an author's life from the perspective of that author, but it's more than that. In her book, The Art of Memoir, Mary Carr says, memoir done right is an art, a made thing. It's not just raw reportage flung splat on the page. She goes on to say, you're making an experience for the reader, a show that conjures your past inside and out. So how do you create a memoir? That is what we're here to find out. I'd like to first introduce Susan J. Twight. A plant ecologist by training, Susan began her career studying grizzly bear habitat, collecting and dissecting bear poop, mapping historic wildfires, and researching big sagebrush. She turned to writing after realizing that she loved the stories behind the data more than collecting the data. Dwight has written 13 books on the nature of life and our place in it, along with hundreds of magazine articles, newspaper columns, and essays. Her latest book, Bless the Birds, Living with Love in a Time of Dying, is a memoir on how to rise to our best when the worst happens. It won the Sartan Award for memoir and was a finalist for the Colorado Book Awards. Twight has taught writing workshops around the country, coached writers, served as a juror for a variety of fellowships and awards, and reviewed manuscripts for publishers and agents. She feels fortunate to have been awarded fellowships and residences at inspiring places, including the Mesa Refuge on a cliff above Tamales Bay in Point Reyes Station, California, a historic casita just off Canyon Road in Santa Fe, thanks to Women's International Study Center, and Carpenter Ranch in Northwest Colorado with the Colorado Art Ranch. Twight's work is driven by terraphilia and her passion for healing and restorying this earth and we who share this planet. And I'd like to give the opportunity now for Susan to do a reading for five minutes, and then we'll introduce our second, our second guest. Thank you. I'm going to um, do something I don't usually do, which is read the very beginning of Bless the Birds, because um, to an audience of people who are interested in memoir and writing memoir and life stories, the structure of the book may be of interest. Um, it's a journey within a journey. So each chapter is framed by a day in a road trip my late husband and I took two months before his death. Um, somehow it seemed perfectly reasonable to travel 4,000 miles in our Subaru SUV when he was dying of brain cancer. Um, seemed really reasonable in our living room, not so much on the road, but it was a great journey anyway. That journey frames each chapter of the journey we took with his brain cancer and of living the end of his life with love. So. I wanted to kind of show you that structure and also to let you know that um, the advice people often give you when you're writing to not give away the ending at the beginning doesn't hold true for everything. In this case, you know he's going to die because that's not the point of the book. 
Um, the point of the book is how we got there, what we did in order to live with love on the way to his death, knowing he was going to die. So chapter one, day one, odometer reading 182 miles. Richard opened his eyes as I slowed the car for the turn to the gravel ranch road. I lowered the windows, letting in the rich smell of new mown hay, along with a distinctive throbbing call. Crrr, crrr, crrr. Sandhill cranes, a smile creased Richard's tanned face. He reached for my hand. I'm a lucky guy. The man sitting in the passenger seat next to me had moon face the high cheekbones and chiseled profile gifted by a Cherokee Chickasaw ancestor, now rounded and puffy, a symptom of the steroids that controlled swelling from a growing brain tumor. His deep set hazel eyes protruded, his muscly chest was soft. But when I looked at him, I saw only the mile wide smile, joyous and tinged with mischief. The same smile that had captivated me when we met almost 29 years earlier the smile that lit up everyone and everything around him. I felt a rush of love, a flood of oxytocin that excited and terrified me as much as it did when I first became his lover. Now I was his caregiver. He had terminal brain cancer, and we were setting off on a 4,000-mile belated honeymoon journey because our time together was short, because we were determined to live every moment. Scanning Richard's face, I was searching for grace, and I'm just going to interrupt myself and say, right there in the narration, we go to the heart of what memoir is about, and that's the reflection. What am I doing now? What does it mean? What does it mean to you who might never go through this journey? So this paragraph is a break from me narrating the story to me reflecting on what it means. Scanning Richard's face, I was searching for grace, which to me is the ability to embrace life with a combination of balance, harmony, and beauty. The ability to be present, heart open, even when, even in, especially in the moments when our hearts want to flinch, freeze, or turn away, when all seems lost, the wounded bird dies in our hands, the strayed child is not found safe and sound, the light of life on this animate planet flickers as if to fade out. I swiped at tears with the hand that should have been holding the steering wheel and drove on toward the ranch headquarters a cluster of white painted wooden buildings. I parked in our usual spot under the spruce tree by the bunkhouse. I'm gonna haul our stuff upstairs. I can help. Richard pulled his six foot length slowly out of the car and then reached behind the seat for his briefcase. I grabbed our duffel, the box with his medications, my briefcase and his pillow. We walked across the lawn and into the historic ranch house. As I turned to go up the narrow stairs to the bedrooms, Richard stopped. You go first, he said. Uh-oh. Richard can manage the stairs, can't he? Betsy, the facilities manager at Carpenter Ranch, had asked when I called about our stay. I relayed the question to him. Of course. His voice carried the confidence of 61 years of having inhabited a muscular and appealingly male form. The voice of a man who could free climb a cliff, sculpt a one-ton boulder, or juggle three balls while balancing on one leg a man who could bound up that steep flight of stairs, carrying our mound of gear. His sense of self hadn't changed, but his abilities had. This Richard froze at the bottom step, his tumor-impaired right brain struggling to make sense of how to ascend. I stopped at the top, arms loaded, watching with a stomach-churning mix of horror and fascination, compelled to witness the effects of the disease I could not stop. Finally, he reached for the handrail and took the step slowly, one at a time, like an old man. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you, Susan. It was hard as hell to write, to tell you that. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, I want to come back to that and how, um, how to get your arms around something so hard. Um, but... We need to introduce our, our second guest, Karen Kamba. Karen has de dedicated her life to mental health advocacy. She's managed nursing homes and medical offices and has worked directly with those aff afflicted with mental illness for years. She was born in rural Nebraska and now lives in Castle Rock, Colorado with her husband, Kurt. She believes in staying in your happy pond and shows up every day to do just that. 
Karen's memoir, The Snipers We Couldn't See, is a harrowing and intimate portrait of the far-reaching generational effects of severe mental illness. Karen, would you like to do your reading now? Yes, I would. And thank you, Corey, very much. I appreciate it. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm giving all the children um, with mental illness in their home a voice. So here we go. This is going to, I'm going to jump around a little bit in my reading, only to give the concept of the diversity and the content, how different it is. And because it's real, it's a memoir of living with uh, schizophrenia. Most people will call this suicide but it really is an act of love. I'm scared I will get so confused and I will not remember my own family. They don't know how to help me yet and I am fearful of ending up in a nursing home, looking out the window, unable to know anything that is going on around me. I'm afraid they will take the farm. Richard, you have worked too hard to have to lose everything in order to take care of me. I will see you again and next time I will be well of Evelyn. That's the last communication from my mother the day that suicide claimed my mother. I was over three years old when my folks welcomed my baby brother. My grandma, who was staying to help for a while, encouraged mom to let me hold him. I'm not sure if it was my mother just being nervous or if she was starting to change inside, but something was going on. There was a venomous look she sometimes gave me though she said nothing at all. It put a scare into my body like an angry northern winter wind blowing right through me, right into my heart. Even as a young, at that young age, I recognized the feeling of emotional betrayal. This began to disconnect between my mother and me that would shroud my heart and mind and threaten to separate us as long, long into our adulthood. I won't swallow mud. Then she let go. There was a stillness. My arm burned where she gripped it. I lay on my stomach listening for a moment. There wasn't sound. I turned my head slightly. Her eyes were piercing. I scrambled away, running before I was even upright. I ran until I couldn't run anymore. I ran to a cow pen where we had a hydrant. It was used for hooking up hoses to wash equipment or give water to the animals. I tried lifting the handle again and again. It wasn't budging. Finally, it gave way and the water came shooting, came shooting down. I gagged and I spat, grabbing my tongue with my finger, scraping the grains of dirt from my mouth. The house looked so far away from where I stood. It seemed like everything was dark around the house, mm -hmm. like it was standing alone in a mist of or fog. At that moment, I thought I will never go back inside. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And now I'm going to jump. And this is where I, I encourage the readers, you're going to have to get the book. I always leave questions. You're going to wonder how I got to this point. And this will show that I'm trying to get it so it goes further through your whole life if you don't get help, if a child does not get help. And when one day I was standing in the middle of the farmyard and mom was hitting my back hard with a large stick, my aunt and uncle drove into the yard. Evelyn, what are you doing to her? My uncle said, jumping out of the car. Mom looked at her brother, but didn't say a word. Later, my aunt took me aside and asked me why I wasn't crying. I told her I could, I could make my body not feel pain. Mm. I saw her puzzled expression, but I couldn't explain it further. I told her not to worry because it didn't hurt. I would be okay. And here's the jump that will be for the readers and they'll, this will depth and you know, bring it deep into your soul, what I'm trying to get through. The nighttime was the worst. I would sit in my apartment, think of my kids and pray they were okay and would someday understand. I don't know if they loved me at this, at this time or, would so, or were so confused about their mother that they didn't know what to think. I know I must have seemed like a crazy selfish person. I didn't know how to stop the war within me. I was driven to stay ahead of the demons in my mind. I don't know whether I was ill or not. I never went to the doctor because I didn't trust them. I saw how they treated my mom, so who could blame me? Somewhere inside me was the will to keep going. I still traveled back from forth from Kansas to Nebraska to see the children. 
When I saw them, there was a deeper kind of pain in my heart, an empty feeling, a lonely, hollow feeling. When I left to return to my new world, I cried for hours. I hated being away from them. I felt I was dying inside. In my mind, but not to their faces, I said, Mama is trying to fix herself. Be patient, my children. I pray my road will lead me home to you someday. And now I'll do it afterward because this is my, my drive. During all the years my mother suffered, I found there was never any help for me. I cannot know who I could have become if I had been allowed to thrive. Instead, my path was one of anxiety, depression, and diminished self-worth. Too often, this is the way of, for children of mentally ill parents. They are overlooked or denied resources that could help them cope at home. My mission now is to keep going and to somehow make a difference. It's not enough to diagnose a parent with mental illness. We must go further to help the children who endure in their environment, environments, children for whom just making sense of such surroundings can be a daily struggle. I spent too much of my life putting myself at risk just to feel wanted. I feared rejection long into adulthood. There were entire decades when I believed I would not be good enough. Now at the age of 63, I have survived. I have mastered my self-worth and I learned that it's okay for me to love myself. That is a gift I want to give others who grew up in the homes like mine, the platform that affirms that they are lovable, that they are, and they have not done anything wrong. I want to lift this weight off children everywhere so they can live a healthy life, find their truth, and fulfill their dreams. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, both of these books are really about challenging, difficult topics, um, and they delve into some really personal, vulnerable places. Karen, let me start with you. Um, how 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 did you get to the point where you wanted to write about such difficult things, and how did how did you how did you do that? I knew when my mother committed suicide. I was twenty nine, and I felt then I knew I had to write. I just had to get the story out there. I felt like there was no reason our family went through this to be in vain. We had to do, I just had it in me for 30 years. So I wrote the book. Um, actually, I didn't even know how to start, but I met a wonderful man, Jim Fay, Love and Logic. And he, I said, Jim, how do I do it? How do I put my life down so I can start helping? Cause I knew I couldn't, if you don't do the book, you're not gonna have the platform to start helping children. He said, sit down with a cup of coffee and pretend I'm sitting there with you and write your story. And I have to say that's where, um, and but I have had it inside my soul. I feel like I was chosen, if you will. I know that it was, it's a, I was meant to do this. And this is my, it wasn't, some write the stories about this to heal. Mine's further than that because I'm going to do something. I, it's it's past the healing. When someone says, I bet this was so healing for you. I was already healed when I wrote it. That is gets to an, a really an important point. Um, and I let me let me turn to Susan. Um, Susan, your story, how how many years separated were you from the death of your husband and the time when you wrote it? Um, I'm a slow writer. I started writing it before he died. We talked about it actually. Um, and it changed a lot. Um, it's been 11 years and it took me eight, eight of those years to get the story right. So I started writing it right away. I, I'm a blogger and also um, a journaler. And I wrote in my journal every day. I still do um, have for years. And I, every week I put a post on my blog while we were going through this journey. And so I was writing kind of the raw data, I would say of the memoir while it was going on. And then before he died, I started compiling that and thinking about the structure of the story. Um, it took me like 12 full revisions to get to the structure it is now, as I really had to I didn't write it for healing um, because we lived the journey together deliberately. I didn't need the healing, just like you've said, Karen. Um, 
even though it was so close and so raw, I didn't need the healing. What I needed was to understand out of all the threads of possible messages there, what mine was. Um, anybody can write a story from their life. The question is what your message is. And, you know, just as you've said, Karen, your message, your, your purpose is to help children heal from the mental illness and deal with the mental illness of their parents. And my purpose is to help people learn that death is part of our lives and that we can, we can journey toward it in a way that we feel loved, that we feel that we learn things from that process and that we don't feel so completely torn up after the transformation that his death happens. Um, and so for me, it was a matter of how do I teach people how to rise to the hardest parts of their lives with the, their best selves? And how do I use my story to give that message? Did you find, Susan, was it, was it hard to be honest? Um, because you have to be, you have to be honest. Absolutely. The hardest part to me is um, to be the self I was in that moment. And there are a number of moments in the book where um, I don't really actually shine. <laughs> One of those is on that long honeymoon journey, we were in San Francisco to visit our daughter and um, stayed in a different motel than we usually stayed in. And she lived up on Tel Hill, Telegraph Hill. And we had always walked from our motel that we usually stayed in to her apartment. Well, my guy has, he may be six feet tall and 185 pounds, but he's losing his right brain. And so his ability to walk sometimes is really vigorous and sometimes it's not. And um, I have to be with him at all times because his sense of direction is completely gone and his ability to figure out blocks and streets is completely gone. And he insisted that we walk the two miles from the hotel we were staying in to Molly's apartment. And I argued with him and lost. Um, and so we're walking along and he steps out into four lanes of traffic in Columbus Avenue, right in front of a bus. And I said something that I'm not going to repeat here on this Zoom call because um, the words are not appropriate for a venue where I don't know who's in the audience, but it wasn't sweet. And I grabbed him by the back of the belt and yanked him out of the path of the bus and said, I blank didn't bring you all this far to get you blank killed in traffic. And then I just went like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The guy who's dying of brain cancer. Good, really good. And he just looked at me and he said, I was just enjoying walking across this city we both love. And I just was like, oh, <laughs> please scrape me up off the pavement and find somebody else to take care of him. You know, it's so brave. It's so brave to 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 share that with an audience, though. Um, and and I think people can feel that um the authenticity yeah. in it. And take them there and one thing that I will brag a little bit about is you have to have an incredible editor that doesn't write for you but tells you you're holding back and um, I had a beautiful team with Beaver's Pond Press actually where Excuse her name me. is Carrie and uh, Lily Coyle put her on with me and she said you got to take them there they have to smell it they have to taste it, they have to feel it, and they have to laugh and they have to cry. And you have to make sure that you think, because my story is so powerful, but you have to bring them to it. Yeah. And then But your story involves um, some real trauma. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit more about deciding what to include and what not to include. And why did you decide what you did? They asked me, do you want it right or do you want it quick? And I said, I want it right. And I want, if I'm going to help these children, there wasn't one thing left out. Okay. All right. I, I went raw. It took me 12 years. I'm old fashioned. I will say, I have to tell, they want to know, I wrote it by hand. I wrote all my book by hand, and then I put it into the computer. And by going by hand, because the tears would come, mm -hmm. and I would take myself there and it was very difficult because your tears were coming, but you write. And then at the end of the day, you have to work yourself back out of it to be able to function through an evening. But you, you take yourself there when you handwrite. You are um, answering a question that I was going to ask later, but let's let's get to it right now, which is um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, the the journey you have to take through your own traumatic history um, to be authentic on the page is hard. Um, and sometimes re-triggering. 
um, because you worked in mental health or, and still work in mental health. Um, tell me a little bit about how you take care of yourself um, and how do you shake that off when you're done writing for the day? Well, I start the day with meditation and my prayers and my th giving thanks. But I also learned every person on this earth is worth being here. And when you finally realize there's not that you're worthy of being here on this earth, no matter what you're doing, you're supposed to be here and you have a beautiful life. And I get up and I affirm that. And I put the smile on because I know that I'm here for a journey to help, but it was also my journey that I lived through. And I also do it for my mother. She didn't choose it. And that's the one thing that I really push in mental health as I, as you ask her, what I do with mental health. It's an asset, it's not a liability. You can turn it around and make it an asset by having mental health. You're living with it. You don't have mental illness, you're living with it. Mm -hmm. And so that is the encouragement. But I, I just uh, get up and get after myself in the morning. Um, it's real easy because I'm already seeing the results. And so I just give thanks that um, I'm a part of someone's journey, hopefully that day. Fantastic. Susan, so, how about you? <laughs> I, you know, it's funny that you start the day with meditation, Karen. I start the day with yoga and prayers. My yoga is a prayer really to what's beyond my skin boundary, to the earth itself and all the lives we share this planet with. So that's my way of grounding myself every day. And working with this book, and it's not my first memoir, but it is my hardest memoir. Um, working with this book, I had to learn how to come out of it at the end of the day after writing because even though I don't write by hand I have lupus and my hands don't hold a pencil well um I live with lupus have lived with it my whole life it's like having a mental illness it's not something you can cure or get rid of it's just part of how my body works and I like my body despite the fact that it's different than other people's so I had to learn how to deal with the stress that would make me sicker of writing this book and my way is I have to get outside every day. I have to take a long walk. The wilder place, the better. Um, I walked so many miles writing this book. I walked miles and miles and miles. Um, just While talking to yourself? While talking to myself, just to dissipate that, you know, to your point, Corey, of the honesty and the authenticity, I had to reach back and be the person I was then. And I'm not always proud of that person. Um, and that's hard. I would like to be the person I'd like to be in print rather than the person I actually was. But the truth is in memoir, no one wants to read about the person who's already perfect. You know, we, we all know that. But it's hard to be that imperfect person on the page and at the end of the day, still love yourself. And so for me, getting out for walks has been my, it's my medicine. It still is. Um, I can't take pharmaceuticals. They don't love me. So my medicine to deal with any stress is get out and walk and walk and walk and walk. And I do. I'm the crazy walking woman. <laughs> um, well, and there's a balance there um, between having some personal boundaries um, and what you want out there in the world and um, creating an authentic character um, mm -hmm. on the page because readers can sniff it out if you're not being your real self. So how, can you talk a little bit about how you figured out how to create the characters of Susan and Karen? I will say for me, and this is something I tell students in writing workshops when I teach memoir workshops, um, memoir is like undressing in public and you get to decide how many layers you take off and that has to serve the story. You take off enough layers to serve the story, but you get to decide what you don't tell too. And you'll know if what you decide not to tell leaves a hole in the story, but it is still your choice how many layers you take off. Um, so for me, it's always been the question of, all right, how much do I tell? I'm an introvert. I'm a lifelong introvert. I've learned to be extroverted to deal with the world of being a writer. Um, but I, there's parts of my life, even though I am very vulnerable on the page, there's parts of my life you're never going to hear about because they don't serve the story. They don't have to do with the story and they're mine. And I'm keeping them to myself. Thank you very, thank you very much. But for me, it's always the question of, do I need to tell this to move the story along? And if I do, I'm going to put on my big girl panties and do it. You know, that's just how it is. And I think for me, Corey, 
to get raw, you'll notice in my book, I don't give people names. Mm. And when I took the names away, then we can tell the story because it's about the story. It's about the mental health. It's about schizophrenia. It's about a child. It's not, and I'm not the only child. Black, white, you know, any, any child on this earth um, is dealing with some form. You know, there's always, they always say, what's your platform? And I said, well, I've got to stay with that platform because one out of every four persons is struggling with some kind of mental health. Your next question should be, how many of those have children? So I knew I had to take the names out so that it would relate across the board. And that's how I could make it raw and real because I didn't feel like I was uh, putting someone in a place. Granted, people that are related to me or friends know exactly where who my life was, but they respect it. 99% uh, of them respect it. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, this is this is more into the, the craft end of how do I do this without hurting my aunt's feelings or my um, my getting fired from my job or you know those kinds of things. How do you deal with the people who are in your life? Because it can't just be a book just about me with with no one else in it. Um, well, Karen, let's, let's have you go first. I think with me, I respect where people are in their life. I didn't write, and I left my siblings out uh, without naming. It's their story. It's their life. They're not going to look at their life the way I looked at my life. Um, the truth was there. By, you know, it's, I think the beautiful thing about family is you have to respect and leave them where they're at and not expect them to be anything more. My, my thing is looking at what my mother went through, what my father went through, what our siblings went through, was enough for me to save some children. So I put that priority higher than my own. And I had to put, it mattered so much more to me to get it out there and start making good with it than it did that I, so on the relative side, so I'll make you smile. I didn't worry about it. I thought, you know, this is too big of a cause. Mental health with children is too big of a cause. And so, but my family, people ask me all the time, what, what, uh, what did your brother say? What did your sister say? What did you? We haven't talked because that's their place and honor to stay where they want to be. And it's not mine to say. So we actually have a beautiful um, understanding. They know what I'm doing. And they, they just, we just, they hope that I bring change. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's some out there that think yeah. I'm glad she didn't <laughs> name me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's some out there that would really like to not, they're really glad I didn't use names, but. How did you solve that problem, Susan? Truth is, is an individual thing. That's what Karen is saying, basically. Our truth, my truth is my truth, and someone else's truth looking at the same incident I'm looking at would probably be different. And my rule has always been that I will tell the truth always, um, but I will be careful to use the truth in a way that it doesn't do damage to anyone else if I can. So I've picked my way through my story um, in Bless the Birds because there are some people who did not come to peace with my late husband's death. And I didn't include them in the story because of that. Um, their story would be different. Um, and some of them are people that are close relatives. Um, and so I just simply left parts of the story out that I felt like weren't germane to our journey and would cause damage. Um, to those who would have been involved. And is I there any part of you that the writer had going, it would be so much better if Uncle there, Joe would just come along for the ride? There's some there's some stories that I left out that are really telling. Um yeah. and it was hard for me, but I felt as a human being that 
I couldn't tell those particular truths without injuring people. And I wasn't willing to do that. And in my story, it was important to name names because it is, I'm using a very personal story to make a very universal point about how we deal with death in this country. Um, we're phobic about it and we pretend it's not going to happen. And we spend a lot of money, you know, on anti-aging creams and things like that in denial um, which is not a river in Egypt. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to take my personal story, our personal story, and make a very, a very clear point about ways we could live with death differently. So it was important to me to contrast the universal point with the really personal story. And I just, I said, all right, there are some things I'm leaving out because they would be so damaging to those particular people that it's not worth it. Um, so in a way, I'm doing a similar thing to what Karen's doing. I'm just going about it in a different way. And I will also say that I'm working with a student right now who has been trying to write a memoir about her growing up and the part of the country where she lived and some really difficult issues of racism and slavery and things like that. And um, she's put a few pieces online um, and gotten really horrible reactions from her family. And I finally said, well, maybe you want to try it as fiction. <laughs> because sometimes a novel will tell that better than a memoir. You know, you can That's tell it. A way to do it. Yeah. Or there have been um, some writers or writing coaches that I've heard have um, talked about the book before it comes out with their, with their beloveds. Um, and had a conversation and removed parts. In fact, I had one client who just removed the whole book because his children were really unhappy with, it, which is kind of a bummer, but it's, I think it's a thing that you have to be willing to, to think about is what, what's the impact of my book and what's going to happen. And how far you want to go with it and what your yeah. purpose of it is. And I just, I think another thing that I'm sure some other authors would share with me this is through my eyes. Yes. If you were standing there, these are my eyes, my feelings. And so you have to, there's some where you, they might've been in the same room, but these were my eyes. And there's my actually eyes. a paragraph at the beginning of Bless the Birds that says, let's see if I can find it. And it's, it's sort of a disclaimer. I mean, it's basically a truth. Um, this book is a memoir, meaning it is my story, mine from my recollections, supported by data from journals, blog posts, and medical records. I've done my best to be accurate and to portray the people and events involved truthfully. I recognize truth is a slippery concept, given that our brains revise our memories to suit our internal narratives. Hence this caveat, this is my take. Others may remember these events differently. And I put that in deliberately to say, this really is my take. It's my story. And you might remember this differently, but this is my truth. And it's important to me to tell it and be clear that it's my truth. I'm not claiming it as the whole truth, you know? And I think that's true with any memoir is we do our best to tell our truth and make it universal, but we can't claim that it is the truth. Right. Karen, your book is in particular um, written from your childhood memories. Um, tell me a little bit more about like, how did you interrogate your, you know, the memory of the 10 year old? Well, the, if you were talking to my friends, they would tell you, um, I'm have one of those wonderful brains that don't forget a thing. So I can go back and tell you the color shirt I wore when I was four. So I'm very fortunate. I was asked that at one of the book club re uh, readings I was doing. I don't forget. So it was really easy to go back. Um, now I will be, uh, very truthful to the audience. There was times when I was writing and I would go back to the seven, eight, nine year old, 10 year old child that I, I had to stop for a couple weeks and then go back. But I have a real neat thing to say. I hadn't seen, there's a very, uh, wonderful friend that was my 10 year old friend in the book and we hadn't seen each other in 50 years and I have her in there and she was incredible and she was my friend and we shared some time 
she reached out to me and she said, you want to know how important your friendship was and how important it was that we had that moment 50 years ago. She kept the Kleenex and little gift that I gave her 50 years. She still had it. So when that kind of impact hits you, Mm -hmm. you know that you were supposed to be back and that it was sometimes it's more than just about you. You might've been in that place for someone else as well. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really, it was, but it was difficult, but I could do it. I went back, um, but there was days, as Susan probably understands, there was days that I just had to uh, close shop and, um, and get back into the fog of a normal life, going to the grocery store and stuff like that, just, just to get my head back out of it for a little bit, because it was too hard. Yeah. Yeah. It can weigh on the body. It can. Yeah. Um, we're, um, we've got about 20 minutes left, so I want to invite audience participants. If you have questions, feel free to add, um, write them in the Q and a, um, and, um, while you're doing that, I would like to ask, um, another question about craft. Um, there is a danger that is specific to memoir writers because it's a really self-centered pursuit. (laughs) If you're not careful, you can either be writing a revenge screed about, you know, your eighth grade English teacher or a very sad, sad story about how you were wronged and it's so terrible. The end. So how, let's start with Susan. How did you, how did you find the authentic truth of, of you? Um, and you know, how do you strip it down without ego involved, I guess? Well, that's kind of related to how you are the real authentic you on the page. Um, For me, that's, um, what do the Zen folks say, beginner's mind? Um, It's going back and remembering what I didn't know when I know now and remembering the self I was then when I'm not now and honoring, um, kind of uh, honoring the imperfections that we all come with, honoring all those things, showing up as myself on the page. And it also helps that I had journals and blog posts to read and they were pretty honest. (laughs) Um, So when I go back and I read those earlier things, which really are sort of the raw data of my memoir, I remember, oh yeah, this is where we are. Oh yeah, this is actually what we did. And I'm the kind of journaler who does the, and it smelled this way. And, you know, there was this sound in the air and that kind of stuff. So putting myself back in that authentic place. And for some people that works with photos, you know, if you have photos of the times you're writing about and can put a photo in front of you and then write from it, it makes it easier to be in that time and in that story and keep your ego out. Um, And for me, as soon as the writing starts being boring, I realize that's when I'm straying from the real story and into the story I would really actually rather create in my head. And that's the ego part. You know, this is how I wish it had been. This is how I wish I had behaved. Um, And as soon as, and I, I read my work out loud always. So one of the editing passes with every single freaking draft of this book was to read the entire thing out loud to myself as if I were reading in a reading. And I find that's a really wonderful way to keep my ego busy um, and actually engage with the real story because I'm hearing it as opposed to reading it on the page or on the screen. So hearing it in my head is a really great way to shut the ego up and really get engaged in the actual story, not what my ego would like to be on the page. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With with me, Corey, it was, um, we actually talked about putting pictures in it. And then we realized, then it became about me. And I wanted the book to be about every child that has experienced this before me, during me, after me. So there's only a couple of pictures in my book and that kept the ego out. Mm -hmm. Um, We worked on that. Um, Another thing that I'll disclose to the audience that I think more of them will want to hear it than not. Some people say, I can't write a book. I can't do it. Um, I don't know how they do it. it. It's, you know, and they, and they end up not doing it. And they start out or they stop. I don't know why in my life um, 
I do know why it's a, that's another whole cover, another whole day, Corey, that we'd have to get together. Um, I was passed through grades and I don't know why anybody realized I couldn't spell. And when my home, when I go home, my home was not your, your home. My, my normal wasn't your normal. I was feared to get off the bus. You know, I was scared to go home almost every day of my life. So there was no studying and stuff like that at home. So this is for the, re the audience out there. This is my gift for you, for anyone that's listening. It took me 12 years to write this book. And someone asked me, "Who? did anybody help you? And I said, no, but I did have some help. And I have a little plastic round disc on my desk called Alexa. And when I wanted a meaning, Mm -hmm. And I, I would ask her for help and her and me wrote this story together and I have no problem saying it. And when I'd want the meaning or then I'd ask her to spell it. Mm -hmm. And I knew what I wanted to say and I knew what words I wanted in there. And I'm not above myself to tell you I used Alexa because I cannot spell very well and I'm proud of it. Um, I think any child or person out there, if you feel you can't spell and that's what's holding you back, you get yourself an Alexa and you go to work because it will help. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. There is no shame in using tools. No. So there's my ego is completely gone. Well done. Well done. Um, I, I, we have some good comments and questions here. Let me start with um, a comment from Sandman. Um, who just wanted to say both Karen and Susan are so brave to share their difficult journey in complete honesty and expose their truth. And he commends and thanks you both. Thank you. Um, a question from Chloe. Memoir often has a great deal of reflection and perspective and feelings about a past event, your truth, um, that often changes over time. Do you think your memoir will still reflect your truth a few, a few years from now? And do you think it's wise for writers to have a cushion of time between an event and writing about it for a public audience? Can I go first? Yeah. Sure. Go for it. <laughs> um, Chloe, that is an excellent question. Um, and I've written 13 books um, and more than one memoir. And I will tell you that if I wrote any of those now again, the reflection and meaning would be different because I'm different. So it's your truth and your reflection, your understanding of that truth, what it means to all the rest of us at the moment you're writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting ad nauseum until you're done. Um, it's not, you can't pin reflection and truth and hold them, or you do that by putting it in print, but you're going to change. And so if you went back and rewrote that book again, it would change. That's just a given, but it's the best you know at the time, the best you can reflect at the time. And how much reflection memoir is just varies by the story. Um, I When I'm reading my work aloud in a memoir, especially, I hear the reflection in my head. I'll be reading the story and realize, oh, there's a place there that I need to interpret that. I need to reflect. And I literally hear that in my head. And it's not like a teacher voice knocking you on the knuckles or something. It's a, ooh, there's a chance to, you know, enlighten, inspire, inform people right there. So stop right there and figure out what it is and write it down. Um, but that, that, the memoir is your is you right then and snapshot you know, in time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I feel the same way Corey I think I don't think my book would change I really don't because it was the childhood part of it yeah. the only thing that could change and I'm praying that it does is as life goes further maybe there could be more in the memoir about uh advancements in mental health mm -hmm. I think that it would be I would maybe have more and more chapters of where we're headed with maybe some success stories and some new medications and things like that. Um, I have two books on the, that I'm working on right now, but they are fiction. So, you know, I've went from there's that, and I'm going to work on that, going to do that. And now I'm going to have some fun. So I'm on the, I'm on, I'm on yeah. the different highway now. Time, doing to, time to take a different, different path yeah. for a minute. Yeah. Just for um, a minute. 
I want to I want to pause the questions for a moment um, because I, I'm interested to hear from the, our audience um, how many of you are currently working on a memoir, personal history, and um, our webinar host has the ability to poll you. So um, she's going to post a question that will pop up, and you can answer that. And um, as you're working on that. Um, Karen, I was I was going to ask you um, when we have like a narrative, especially you know a, a hero's story, and you're the hero in the story. Often there's a bad guy in the story, but that bad guy in your story was a relative, was your mom. Mm -hmm. How did you frame that, or how did you how did you struggle with that that problem to make it? What you what I found, Corey. That's a very good question. What I found when I was writing is my whole and fear and life with my mother seemed to consume me. Mm -hmm. But when I found when I was writing, I also was angry at my father mm -hmm. because he didn't save me, you know? And then what comes to the end of the story as people will read, not to ruin the story or anything for anyone, but it's, it's I, I don't mind doing that. Um, I found that it's about forgiveness, about mental health. Everybody did what they best they could. And at the end, you will find that I, the forgiveness to my father, the forgiveness to my mother, the forgiveness to myself uh, was huge. And so it, it did a complete turnaround of, it's like a cancer, if you will, Susan. It's like we survived, we did the best we could, and this is where we got. Mm -hmm. and it was no one's fault so that's where it led yeah. if that answers yeah. it. um our poll oh this is i've never used this feature before it's very cool it's about half and half our um audience members uh 46 percent are say yes they are working on a memoir or personal history and 54 say no good so that helps us, um, helps Very us a little good. bit. And we have some great craft qu craft questions over here. So let me yeah. move on um, to a question from Tanya. Actually, I'm sorry, Tanya is a comment um, and she's thanking you both. Um, so I'm going to put this over here um, so you can both read that in the, in the answered questions. Thank you, Tanya. I appreciate that. Um, from Alicia. In the constant rewriting process, as you say, you change as time goes by. So how do you know when to stop? That's a great question. How do you know when you're done? I'm going to tell you, I was, I knew I was done when I had, because I had the best editor in the world. And she, she finally said, we're done. <laughs> she said, we're done. We have, we have, we worked a year together. She, you know, we, I mean, literally 12 months of, beating that thing up and beating me up and beating drain me out and she goes you don't have anything left in the tank we're good to go so we uh we both uh, could only hug through zoom but she told me when i was dead susan um that's a great question <laughs> it's really a great question and it's different for every story and every person and I'm sorry I'm not evading the question for me I know when I'm done when I have no more interest in it um, I have had the experience of writing something to death to the point that it's no longer interesting and I've learned when to hear when my interest in continuing to revise the manuscript it has faded, but I've also learned to hear that feeling of, yes, this is it. We've got it now. This is truly it. Um, and with Bless the Birds, I thought it was done about six times, six revisions before it was really done. And then when I found the structure of the journey within the journey of using our honeymoon trip toward the end of Richard's life, um, as the framework of the larger journey of our lives, how we got to be the people we were, how we met, um, how we lived before his brain cancer, um, his daughter who I helped raise, all of those stories wound in, but in the framework of this 4,000 mile road trip, 
that the guy whose brain was so impaired he couldn't read a map because he couldn't tell which was upside up and which was upside down. Um, oh no. And furthermore, as he said one day, I think my brain doesn't talk to my penis anymore. And that was a comment after saying, I think I have to pee and me going, I think that horse is out of the barn already. Oh, no. carried it on its towels. Um, <laughs> that um, journey, which has a lot of humor in it, yeah. made a perfect framework for this larger journey toward his death and through his death. And once I had that, I knew I had it. I could feel it. It's a visceral thing, partly. And you may have felt that too, Karen. I don't know. But for me, it was a really visceral thing. This is it. I've got it. It's yeah, good. I I absolutely did. I felt oh, it. Intuition. I love that. Um, we have a, a question um, about structure. How important is having a roadmap and structure before really diving in writing? And if not important, how can we maintain focus without that structure? Susan, let me have you go first. It's super not important <laughs> because memoir is like fiction in the sense, not that you're making it up but that you're dealing with character development and a strong narrative arc and narrative tension. And if you try to control that story with a roadmap, um, you're gonna control it till it's not interesting anymore. So it's really important to follow the story wherever it takes you. And sometimes you'll realize you just went down a rabbit hole you know, and you may have gone a long ways down that rabbit hole and it's not really a rabbit hole that's germane to the story, but that's okay because that's part of exploring the depth and width and scope of that story. But if you have a roadmap to begin with, you will probably not have an interesting story. And how do you keep your focus? That's going to be different for everybody. Um, but one way is to say to yourself each day, two things. Um, one small technique I do, um, and that is that I never end at the end of a paragraph at the end of the day. I stop in the middle of a paragraph. So I have some a thread to pick up. Um, and that helps me be focused. And the other is ask yourself at the end of the day, what you feel is next in the story. Mm -hmm. And Beautiful. just a note or two down about that. I can be, and I'll be the humorous one. Let's talk, <laughs> let's, let's say, let's tell it, let's tell it my first memoir. First thing, I'm going to save a lot of them. I'd started this structure first trying to record. Mm. That was, so I was trying to record send my recordings to a transcriptionist. She'd send it back, it'd be 14 pages. It looked like some kind of essay that I was not enjoying. And so then I thought I might get a ghostwriter and I do, Rick, I do love ghostwriters, Corey, I absolutely love ghostwriters, but I knew that she couldn't get inside my body. She couldn't feel it. And I thought, how am I gonna make this woman cry when I, you know, when she didn't live inside? So, I knew that wasn't going to work. And so I went through the structures of trying to listen to every, all the readings and you Google this and you Google that, how to write. Finally, I just set the pen, I just set the pen tablet down and went to work. And when I did not worry about anything and I didn't think about it's just like playing golf, you know, when the more lessons you get, the worse you get. If you just go out there and just hit the ball, you're going to hit the ball, you know, a lot further because you're not thinking. So if you just take all that and you take that piece inside and you just trust your soul and you just put the pick up the pen or the computer and uh, go to work. Um, don't do all that other stuff if it's not. It, uh, yeah, uh, I think almost I, lost. I wasn't so it. determined. Yeah, uh, I, I wasn't so determined. It wouldn't have made it. Right. Yeah. I think the advice is apply butt to chair. Yes. <laughs> butt in chair. Butt yes, in yes. chair. We have time for one last question from Tanya. Um, were you both nervous to have your family or kids read your stories? Were you how is this such such personal stuff? How did you feel when you finally launched that baby out in the world? Well, that probably will hit me probably at first. Um I didn't want to make them cry but I wanted them to know my mother, their mother. Um, I did have one child read it because I knew I couldn't stop them. I've asked the other child not to hmm. because it's just not in that child's best interest hmm. right at this point in that person's life. This book's not going anywhere. 
it, it will be there when you want to read it. But when someone is being so successful and they got so much going on in their lives, um, maybe they, I could just tell one child didn't need to and one did. Yeah. 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 Uh, my, my most difficult moment was actually not when my brother read it or my sister-in-law or my stepdaughter or all that it was when my middle niece told me that she had given it to her 13 year old daughter who is brilliant and I love and I went did you read it first because there's some scenes in there that maybe she's not ready for she was my first reviewer <laughs> it's a great review the before the book was even published I love that yeah. <laughs> so it, it worked out that's what used to say but I was like oh, mm, mm, oh, okay well done well done yeah. well I I really want to thank you both and um there are so many wonderful comments um from our our participants here so thank you audience for being here with us and thank you Susan and Karen for being with us mm -hmm. um thank you to our sponsors um I want to let everyone know that old firehouse books in old town Fort Collins has copies of Susan and Karen's book for sale um, at their store and at oldfirehousebooks.com. And um, this is just the beginning of a month of author talks, panels, readings, workshops, and all kinds of literary fun. And you can find the schedule on our website at focobookfest.org. Thank you again, everyone. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you very much. Good to meet you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. God bless. Thank you, Susan. That was wonderful. I was just checking out the Q and A's and the um, other comments. Oh, okay. And then I'll leave. I just didn't want to leave before I looked at those. Yeah. <laughs> that really was wonderful. It was. That Thanks was so much, Molly. Fantastic. Sorry about the sorry about the sound issues at the beginning, but no, good. no, good figuring them out. <laughs> yes, no, not your fault. So <laughs> I'm sorry. But and, um, yeah, that worked out really well. So I enjoy the rest of the lineup. What a great, what a great series of events. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Well, take care. Good luck with your move. Thanks. Okay. You Bye. Too.